Go for it. You guys are live. All right. Hey, everybody out there. Uh, thanks for tuning in. This is Nathan Seidel with SparkFun Electronics, uh, the kind of hardware guy behind the Apollo 3-based SparkFun Edge. Um, and we've got Pete here as well. Pete, say hi. Hey, so yeah, I'm Pete from the TensorFlow team. Uh, I'm one of the software people behind uh, what you can do on the SparkFun Edge. Yeah, and we're just hanging out today to answer questions and talk to folks and talk hardware and software and everything else. Um, so I think we've got some questions from the audience from back in the day. So uh, Chris, what is the first question you want to cover today? So the first question is from Neil Stoker from Twitter. Have For, you any insights on, or, uh, on the challenges of dealing with accents in such a small model? Yeah. I can I can definitely uh, talk to that having an accent myself. <laughs> um, one of the biggest challenges we actually faced was that there's almost no good public data, no good open source data out there for training these kind of speech models. So the first thing we did last year actually was put together the open uh, speech commands data set, which is about 100,000 utterances of people saying single words, um, all labeled, um, that was actually donated by volunteers. Uh, now, a lot of the volunteers were American, <laughs> which is why <laughs> we have a lot of, um, you know, ability to recognize American accents. Um, but we actually have a live link, which I can, uh, I think I can send on and add to the chat, um, which we want people to go to and basically spend five minutes donating their voice. So you go through a series of prompts on a web page, um, you say the word that's shown, that gets added to the data set, um, and then we go through the data set and we add, um, we'll add those utterances, the 100,000 utterances that are already there. And by increasing the amount of data that's available for the training, that should help with the, um, uh, with the accent problem. Um, so that's, that's really, I'll, I'll actually go right now to my webpage and get you the uh, right link. <laughs> so you can follow that. But anything you can do to add more data will really be a massive help. And it will generally help with the accuracy overall. You know, the accuracy is not where we want it to be yet. You know, it's a good, you know, we're hoping it's a good start, but we want to keep improving the accuracy. So anything we can do to get more data, we're trying a lot of things on our end, but anything the community can do to add your voices would be awesome. Cool. And Pete, I won't hold you to this number, but how, I mean, in the future, years from now, as TensorFlow sort of gets better, how how good do you think the algorithms can get? What's the goal? <coughs> What's... That's, that's a really good question. And the nice thing is that <clears throat> what we've seen is that as you add more data and as you add more compute, the models so far have not stopped improving in accuracy. Oh, oh, excellent. Okay, yeah. So, so that's actually a good. That's actually, I think, good news. Yeah. Um, <laughs> excellent. So, we get constant improvement. That's um, great. Yeah. I will. I will try to contribute whatever I can. And we have some sort of you know paper research papers and graphs that show you know for example when you go from one million images on ImageNet to a hundred million things get better when you go from a hundred million to 10 billion things get better images. So like there, there seems to be, we haven't hit the limits of where, you know, adding more data makes these models better. So. Excellent, that's really good news. Awesome. All right, do we have the next question? <coughs> Can you give us an overview of how the collaboration Ah, yeah. Uh, I think it was a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Alistair. Alistair, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Introduced us and said, hey, I know a hardware guy, and uh, Nate, I know a software guy. And so Pete and I, well, you're actually, we go back before then. We go back like, what, a decade? Yeah, I didn't realize, I, I, I didn't make the connection until Alistair made the introduction. But I used to live in Boulder for a couple of years when I was going through Techstars, the incubator program. And yeah. Nathan was a mentor. 
and we actually i wasn't even doing any hardware stuff but i was interested to chat to him so we had a great conversation yeah um, it's crazy how small the worlds collide um yes. yeah and and so uh pete and i and alistair all started talking about doing a board and i was very excited about it because um the specific chip that they had found the apollo 3 um was a, a point five millimeter pitch BGA, which was something that SparkFun had not really gotten into before. And so I enjoyed it because it was a technical challenge and it also pushed our production capabilities forward. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a great sort of com combination of two worlds. Yeah, and from my side, I was really impressed by a board that the Ambic team had put together for trade shows. Uh, that was actually the size of a quarter, the size of a coin battery. Um, and they actually had it uh, running some proprietary ML stuff to actually recognize um, Alexa. <laughs> 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 and I was super impressed because it was running on a coin battery for days or weeks doing this continuously. Um, but obviously I wanted it to run TensorFlow <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were keen to have it run TensorFlow too. So we were working on that, but they weren't looking at doing any kind of mass production, but they were willing, they were very, luckily very happy to share a bunch of information and work with SparkFun and us to get this turned into a real product, which I was really excited about. Yeah. And Ambic support has been really phenomenal. So we've been very happy with them. All right, do we want to jump to the next question? This is from our website, from uh, Evo, Evo George. Uh, the camera connector is included on the edge, but camera support is still under development. Could we get an overview of this work and the plans, as well as some initial pointers, uh, e.g. how is a camera actually connected to the connector, uh, so we can get started and participate on the camera support development? Yep, uh, I'll, I'll field this and then Pete, you can kind of fill in the gaps. Um, so what we're talking about is that little camera connector right there uh, was spec'd out to mate with uh, kind of an old camera technology now. I think it's the uh, OV7260 or I forget the exact part number, but it's a, a ribbon cable connector for a camera that we found and it was, it was just a moonshot. It was a let's try to include this on the board, but we have no idea if this is gonna work. Um, uh, Pete and I really wanted to focus on voice recognition, voice recognition, and then potentially gesture recognition, and then the imagery, it was like way in the future. So we have gotten preliminary, uh, the, the samples and the camera, we've got it kind of talking to the Apollo 3. The main issue is that the camera uses many milliamps of power. And so you really destroy the power capabilities using that camera. That said, um, Pete, help me out. Uh, the company that we're talking to is Hi it Hymax. Yeah, Hymax has an incredibly low power camera, uh, and they've been very eager to get uh, their camera working with Pete's software. So uh, it's it's in the works, uh, but I think from a hardware perspective, we're electrically there. Uh, from a software perspective, Pete can Pete can speak more to that. Yeah, and we're also we've been talking to anybody who's interested in low power cameras. So we've been talking to HiMax. We've also been talking to Pixar, who do mm -hmm. interesting low power cameras. Um, I think the original part we were looking at was the Ovic, uh, but that's kind of high, a bit higher power. Um, and the nice thing is that a lot of them actually have driver software sort of on their end that works on sort of Cortex M platforms. So I'm hoping that it turns into a um, more of a figuring out the right wiring and the right pins and kind of porting their software to, um, you know, this platform, but it hopefully it won't be a case of actually creating entirely new software from scratch. And I saw an interesting comment on the SparkFun website where someone was saying, oh, perhaps it works with the Raspberry Pi camera. And I want to tell, no, it doesn't work with the Raspberry Pi camera. Uh, interesting thing is that you, like image recognition, you don't want more pixels. You don't want like a three megapixel camera. Um, some of these algorithms are working on 
you know, what it's like 48 pixels. I mean, it's incredible how <clears throat> low density they can get and still get sort of that, that object recognition. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm, I'm excited to get the camera connector and the camera interface working. Um, but I think for me personally right now, um, the, the voice and the gesture recognition are, are higher up on the priority list. Yeah, and we see um, getting, we know there's a bunch of work on to get on the software and the hardware side to get the camera recognition going. So we're actually trying to work on that in parallel together with um, improving the software for the audio and the and also trying to write an accelerometer example. Um, <laughs> Just, so, you know, three, three plates to spin. Yeah, three yeah. things to juggle. Excellent. This question comes from Maxim Sergei from the, uh, from the live comments. Hi, I'm an enthusiast of IoT on the edge. One of my featured projects is a smart doll house that uses motion controller and Raspberry Pi with machine learning to perform actions. I found it hard to find good open source implementations of research papers and training data for gesture recognition. Is there a plan for having a centralized resource for ML on the edge modules? Yeah, maybe I can uh, speak to that. And I've actually had the same problem uh, trying to find gesture recognition um, an accelerometer data sets. Um, so like we did with the speech commands, what I'm actually expecting is that unless we can find the right data set out there, we're going to have to create our own data set and we might be looking for volunteers again. <laughs> and yeah, because, you know, the interesting thing with the speech commands um, example is if you actually look at the code, the neural network part is a comparatively small part of it there's all of this supporting code for actually creating the features you feed into the neural network and you know creating the date you know the work involved in creating the data set and everything else um actually ended up taking a lot more of the time so we're hoping if we can help be kind of a central hub for a lot of the data sets and the feature generation and things like that that you need to do this stuff um we're hoping that will be helpful but if you have data sets, we, we'd also love to use them. We don't, we don't want to do that work unless we have to, but. Yeah. Excellent. Joel, Joel Barton asks, why two mics on the board? Uh -huh. Pete, you want to tackle that one? Uh, sure, yeah, so I think, it was because that's what the reference board that we were using from Ambic had. And it didn't seem like a bad idea and it didn't seem to add too much to the bill of materials. Um, and it seemed like it might be useful in the future for doing things like beam forming uh, if we wanted to go in that direction. Um, so it was just really that was the design that we started with and it seemed to, it didn't make sense to change it, I think. And from a kind of a hardware question perspective, uh, we at SparkFun implemented the two microphone design using uh, analog microphones instead of digital PDM microphones. Um, I don't, I, I'm curious, Pete, I think in retrospect, uh, would you have gone with the PDM microphones instead? That would have given us like one more bit of resolution? I, I think we would have, and just partly from the software side, I had to do some things like figure out what the sort of resting voltage was. And I'm still not sure if the resting voltage is kind of changing as the battery drains and things like that. So I, I want to go back and like visit that because um, there were some things that, some extra variables I had to deal with using an analog ADC um, that would have been taken care of by the PDM. I also don't know how that affected the uh, the cost. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's it's crazy when you start getting into a fifteen dollar item. Uh, nickels and dimes make a big difference. So uh, I'm excited to revisit that on a future version. Um, yeah, that's going to be on one of the prototypes that we do together. Is just PDM microphones, uh, single versus dual, and see how it see how it performs. Right. Patrick Wenschler asks, how do you imagine this board being used? Are there any use cases that are particularly interesting to you? Hmm. Uh, 
Pete, I'll take a stab at it, and then I'll, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, for me personally, um, I have harped on privacy for a long time and the ability to have something that can react to m my words without pushing all of my words out to the cloud is very important to me. So the ability to have a board that can respond to, I don't know, the word umbrella, and then uh, perhaps it lights up what the weather is going to be like, or I, you know, I, there's, there's a lot of uh, I, I don't want to say IoT examples, but the ability to trigger things around me, um, whether it's the unlocking of a door, the raising of shades, or uh, the projection of information, um, is very exciting to me. So the fact that this board, um, in the preliminary stages, can respond to the word yes, means in the future we can have boards that respond to other words. And so in my head, the use case is having sort of very bespoke, discrete things around my house that respond to certain trigger words and do certain uh, very helpful small tasks that I need done. Um, but I'm really sort of the hardware guy that's throwing microcontrollers at all the problems around my house. So um, yeah, kind of, Pete, what, what do you see in the future? Um, the original starting point, we had what's called a moonshot within the Google Brain team um, that we sort of called TensorFlow Everywhere. And one of the original use cases was, can we have a 50 cent chip that runs for a year on a coin battery that responds to voice command? Oh, yes. that's cool. This is, this is a step towards that. Um, but you know, the, what I really hope is that anywhere that you're using like a switch or a button or a touch screen at the moment, you have a little component, a black box component that you can just drop in to your design uh, and have it respond to a voice interface instead. That's so um, cool. And one of the reasons I'm so interested in the camera, having the camera though as well, is I think that having gaze detection, so that you don't have to use a wake word, that things can tell when you're looking at them. Yeah, yeah. And then respond to commands like intelligently, like, you know, we do or pets do as, you know, to people. Like, they, you know when somebody's talking to you. Um, so you don't need to kind of have this artificial sort of wake word type thing. So, yeah, I, I want to end this kind of magical sort of Disney world where everything is talking to you and you can kind of interact with all of the objects around your house and in the world, just like you can with uh, people. Oh, that's uh, that's really cool. Um, and the the fact that, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but we're basically an order of magnitude off. But in the in the technology world, that that's not that bad. Um, so we're already at uh, like a couple days, a couple weeks on the coin cell, and I think we can even improve on that. And then cost wise, yeah, we're at fifteen dollars, but that that can be improved upon as well. Yeah, and I would also, if you want to see really good voice recognition running locally on a device, if you have a Pixel phone, um, you can actually use Google's transcription service now, and it runs at server quality locally on the phone. Huh. So that's like full quality, the best speech recognition we can do, and it runs completely without a network connection locally on a device. Now, that's a an application processor with like megabytes in memory and you know billions of floating point operations a second but at least it's kind of showing that we're getting like this isn't a crazy this isn't that crazy a pipe dream like we just have to make this keep in, keep working on the implementation and make it happen cool all right Bruce boys asks just ordered a couple of boards what is the state of SPY and I squared C libraries? How hard is it to port generic C++ libraries to this M4 processor, e.g. I squared C T3, I squared C T and C, which is also an M4? Got it. Uh, let's see. So the how to answer that, Ambic has provided a really fantastic SDK. And within their SDK is something called HAL, which is the hardware abstraction layer. Um, we were able to get the accelerometer working within a couple hours because ST, the manufacturer behind the accelerometer, had a, a nice library that we could easily implement using the HAL. So as long as you're comfortable at that abstraction layer level, um, it should be pretty straightforward to port any Arduino library or any library you find out there to I2C and SPI. 
Now, from a hardware perspective, I don't remember how many of the SPI pins are broken out to the GPIO. So the hardware, the SparkFun Edge may be limited by its GPIOs. I, I want to say that the the GPIO the GPIO is on the edge. Let me show you um, these pins down here. Uh, I believe we broke out a hardware master down there, so you should have an extra set of I2C and SPI pins down there. Um, you've also got the quick board. Um, we uh, to port that is pretty straightforward for someone who's comfortable with an SDK. Uh, that said, we're also working on an Arduino port. And so if that ever comes to fruition, uh, it's going to be a month or two at least. Uh, but we will work very hard to get all of our current Arduino libraries supported on the Apollo 3. Dan asks, could you train a model to classify analog sensor data and deploy it onto the edge board? Pete. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now that's that, that's kind of a big question, but I'm guessing you might be thinking of something like predictive maintenance, for example, to give a concrete example, like, yeah. hey, is a bearing starting to wear down? Um, so the speech command model actually isn't a bad example to use for any time series data. So if you're able to take time series data and extract the spectrogram from the FFT, so basically take slices of time data, figure out what the frequencies are, and then stack them over time to form an image, um, then you can actually run fairly straightforward image recognition neural networks to kind of tell the difference between different conditions in your analog input data. Cool. Um, yeah, and it's like the, the, the guide I usually say is see if you can create those spectrums kind of as the first thing you do and then just fade them out and then look at them yourself. And if you can tell the difference between, say, like a bearing that's wonky versus one that's running fine just from the spectrum, then there's a good chance that the neural network will actually be able to do that too. God. And then for gathering lots of data. I, you need a lot of bearings. You need a lot of training data. Um, that's that's really exciting because uh, for you know 15 years, 16 years, as long as SparkFun has been around, um, as sensors have gotten cheaper, uh, getting you data has become easy. Ga you know, ga gathering all this stuff has become easy. Turning that into information is the trick. And so uh, that's really exciting that, um, yeah, TensorFlow and machine learning may help convert um, this gentleman's uh, analog values into information rather than just analog values. Huh, cool. No, I mean, it drives me crazy that we're able to collect so much sensor data and it's so hard to, like, so costly from an energy point of view to transmit it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just end up dropping most of it on the floor. And there's, we know that there's really useful, actionable information in there that we can make use of, and that's why open machine learning will help. Excellent. Bruce asks, I'm interested in, re in reinforcement learning for messy control challenges, such as HVAC, which views indoor and outdoor sensors and currents and forecast weather data. Is this a good board for such a task? So I would actually say, get something working with like a desktop machine stuck in your system first and only once you manage to get the machine you know the the model actually working then start to look at actually porting the model down on smaller and smaller devices you know go to Kvartu Army which has a full pip install tensorflow um, and see if you can once you've got a model running, see if you can make it go to the Raspberry Pi, and then start to look at something like Spark um, as your final deployment. So, because really, what, what I recommend is just get the model. If you can get the model working on any platform, like that's usually the biggest challenge. <laughs> and then porting it down to something that's kind of smaller and cheaper is then turns into an engineering challenge. Agreed. My uh, my only addition to that is uh, the 
only limitation of the Apollo 3 is that it has BLE and no Wi-Fi. And so capture, you know, how are you going to input some of that data onto the board? Um, totally agree with Pete, start with something bigger and, and get proof of concept down. Um, the, only ha having BLE on the Apollo 3 is great, uh, but you do have some, you know, data constraints on that. You, yeah. So um, cool project. Yeah, good, good luck. Maxim asks, how many different speech commands can be potentially recognized by the edge board? My use case is to have 30 different keywords. Is that achievable with this board? <laughs> so not right now. It's not a limitation of the board. It's more a limitation of the software. And coming back to the, um, the data gathering, um, we have the ability to sort of recognize about 10 commands. And you can actually download a free TensorFlow-like example that you can run on your phone to test the accuracy of that. Um, and the accuracy is OK, but you wouldn't want to use it for something mission critical. Um, so it's not outside the realm of reason, I guess I would say, but it's not going to be something you can just do straight out of the box. It will really depend on what your requirements are. Uh, but I'd be. Uh, and one thing I should say is that um, my email is pete at google.com. Um, and for any of my follow-up questions or anything like uh, that, I'm happy to you know, go into more depth um, if you want to, if anybody wants to drop me an email. So maybe we can also add that email to the, to the comments or put it online somewhere so people can get hold of me. Cool. And uh, Pete, just to kind of give me some perspective, um, to train something, let, let's say I wanted it to fire on the word um, umbrella. How big of a data set would I need? It sounds like it's in the tens of thousands of voice clips that I would need to get, if not more, before I begin to attain any kind of accuracy. So that is somewhat true, but there's also some magic called transfer learning hmm. where if you actually are able to start off with a large data set of say 30 or 40 um, commands um, or different words that aren't the words you're looking for but actually trainer models do really well on those then you can actually use a much smaller data set of your custom words uh, okay. that you want to reckon you know to sort of fine-tune that model. So that's one of the things that we're actually hoping to have as an example sometime soon. We don't have an exact ETA, but doing this sort of transfer learning. So, um, you know, because there are some things you can also do to make it easier. Like um, at the moment, we're trying to do speaker independent voice, voice command recognition. But if you are only trying to recognize words from a limited set of people, um, that actually makes the problem easier, so we can do sort of transfer learning to Got it. train to it. Help with that. So, in theory, sometime in the future, I would be able to train it for my specific family or my specific environment and increase precision a little bit, accuracy. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. This message comes from Twitter. Yeah. What sort of new features can we expect from the Edge Board in the future? Uh, Pete, do you want to field that one first? Sure. I mean, we're continuing to push forward on the software side. So we want to have the, we hope to get the voice uh, recognition more accurate, more flexible. We hope to have an accelerometer example um, so that you can actually do gesture recognition using the accelerometer. Um, and we're working on the camera getting some camera examples uh, out there and ready. Um, so from our side, those, those really are the top three things that we're working towards. And from a hardware perspective, uh, I'm, a, I'm a hardware geek. So it's, it's mundane things like um, it, when you get the edge to reprogram the edge, you have to put it into bootloader mode, which means you have to hold buttons and do different things. Um, I really want to get an automatic reset 
circuit working on the edge so that um, you just say, you know, make upload and it pushes the code and you don't have to mess with the buttons. Um, we're pretty close on that. That'll take a hardware revision. And then uh, I mentioned the Arduino port. So making it so uh, you have both an, an extremely powerful machine learning board, but if you need to add your own sort of code, um, you can either do that with HAL or you can do that with uh, Arduino, theoretically in the future. And then, um, the last bit of hardware that we really haven't scraped the surface on is the, the BLE, the radio interface. Um, so that is in the works, and we're um, t trying to button that up as best as usable as possible so that folks can use the BLE radio as well. So coming soon, all coming soon, we're working. From the same user, what sort of projects do you want to make with the Edge? Yeah, Pete, I want to know, like, do you have any, like, what projects do you work on in in your free time? It's it, are are you like me where it's like <laughs> electronics all the time, or is it um is this just sort of the 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 day to day? Oh no no I really like my um my fiance will tell you that if, if I could turn the computer around you see I'm completely surrounded by tiny computers <laughs> every yep. as far as I can see yep. um and I just really love the idea of having these little um, devices doing their thing independently on like battery power or the thing I'm actually really excited about is um, energy harvesting as well like we're in the mm -hmm. realm now of like low single digit kilowatts yeah. where I'm hoping that it, even like ambient room lights might be enough to power yeah and then you actually have something that's gonna you know be pretty much live forever theoretically doing its job out in the world um, so i wanted to i want to, yeah that's we haven't talked about this mate i'd love to figure out if there's some uh, we, hardware magic you can do yeah, we we did we talked about initially where it was uh uh pete alistair and i were all sort of kicking things around when we first got together and we were designing the board and it was like oh can we add this solar cell can we add the ability to power via solar cell and we never got to explore that route but now that we've got the edge out there, um, yeah, the fact that this thing is pulling less than a milliamp, uh, as you say, single digit milliwatts is really intriguing. And you're right, we need to go back to that and figure out just all the different ways we can power it. Um, yeah, that neat. Um, and then, yeah, personal applications for this board, I, I don't have any I am working on. Um, it's one of those things where, when you work on a thing really hard for a couple months, um, you just need to let it sit for a while. And uh, I, I enjoy working on it, but I have not implemented it in any of my own projects yet. Uh, but someday, yeah. And I guess I'm really interested as well in, there's a bunch of nonprofits doing interesting things around like um, uh, wildlife, uh, data gathering especially, and trying to make sense of all of this sense of data. Uh, you know, even thinking like uh, recording bat signals or actually listening out for mosquitoes. They have, I guess different species have different uh, frequencies of cool. make, and I, I, I would really love to help out with some of those. Like, with your, I've just been chatting to people in that area. But that's, that's one of my sort of dream applications. I'd love to see what's happening in the world, like helping, help, helping wildlife nature rather than that's awesome and now you've got me thinking like what the frequency response is of these mems microphones because they're probably very much tuned to the human range uh but can we take that up into the you know tens of kilohertz yeah huh cool yeah nice nice application all right chris patrick asks can you train this device directly for example, a roving robot covered in distance sensors. Could it be trained with a remote control? We, that's, that's a quick question, I guess. So I'm happy to sort of take that on. We aren't currently doing any training on device. Um, but what's interesting is that there are different levels of training that you can offer. Like the most simple level of training is kind of customizing or personalizing a network, like trying to help it recognize your voice, you know, on top of the generic training. So that's kind of a little bit of fine tuning of some of the layers on the very top of the network. Um, 
And then there's things like doing full retraining of the network with back propagation and things like that, which I don't think is going to be in the in the in the future, in the, at least in the near future of the work that we're doing. Um, that's much more something that you can do on like a Raspberry Pi, um, especially because if you're actually running on a robot, then you're using a fair amount of power for locomotion and things like that. So the one milliwatt you know, or low single digit milliwatt power usage of this board, which is really one of its unique features, isn't as um, compelling. Like, um, yeah, the robot's not running on a coin cell, so it does it defeats the purpose. Yeah, cool. From Twitter, could I use any other type of microphone other than the ones on board? Hmm. Um, from a hardware perspective, uh, that should not be a problem. Uh, from a actual, you know, use case perspective, you're going to have to get a little savvy with hot air rework. Um, so the two microphones uh, are run through an uh, operational amplifier to boost the signal. So you would need to hot air off the whichever microphone you want to work on, and then solder to the pads to the either electric or whatever type of microphone technology you're using. Um, it, it's possible. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, the op amp is what we set the gain on the op amp to like 75x. So the, yeah. the, the op amp was tweaked very specifically for this application. Um, that isn't to say that you can't then change the amplification gain, uh, but um, it's workable. Uh, it's just um, not really designed for that. So um, if you do get it working or if you do go down that route, please let us know. Um, we would love to kind of see how what you'll learn as you try it. Um, we're out of questions now. So how about uh, some final thoughts from you two? Like, where do you see the board going within the next six months? Mm. Um, I, uh, I have some ideas around the, the, the kind of the Apollo 3. And for me, the, the fact that Ambic has figured out how to do low power Cortex M4 with floating point is, is really the game changer. So um, wearables, hearables, things that run on battery should see a dramatic boost in performance and runtime just because we can do so much more processing at such, uh, what are we at? Like, yeah, a milliwatt or two, it's, it's kind of crazy that we can run on coin cells. Um, so I'm excited to see the future products that SparkFun plans around the implementation of the Apollo 3. On top of that, uh, the ability to run TensorFlow on those platforms means that we can really do some interesting machine learning aspects. Um, for me, it's not necessarily voice recognition, but as we talked about before, the ability to turn data into information and using machine learning to get that done um, is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Uh, but yeah, what, what do you think, Pete? Um, what you said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the the thing I'm excited about as well is, like you were saying, it's it's much more than just voice recognition. Um, it's the fact that the same technology can be used to kind of detect people in images. It can be used to do predictive maintenance. It can be used to do gesture recognition. So by putting the effort into the TensorFlow framework side, I'm hoping we're opening up a, a really nice toolkit for people to kind of solve all sorts of other problems using this board. And it's, for, for me, it's, um, you know, if I had a thing in my pocket that was detecting my gait was somehow different, I was, I was limping or, you know, if it could tell me like, oh, something's wrong with your knee or you should get that, that that's excellent. But if that's being transmitted out to the web to do the analysis and then it comes back down, that's very disconcerting to me. So the ability to keep it a pan or personal area network um, is, is a lot more exciting to me than uh, very large server farms out somewhere in the world. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty bullish and pretty excited about where this goes. Cool. One last question. One last question, all right. Uh, it's from Patrick, and I personally want to know this too. Have you seen any interesting tech related to aggregating data from a network of smart sensors? For example, if you had a bunch of boards counting animals in the forest, the problem, be, uh, the problem becomes how do you 
then collect that data from those edge devices. Well, this is kind of a two-part question. So the first part was, um, have I seen any large sort of distributed um, uh, data analysis things? I'll answer that one first just because it came to the top of my head. Um, this is apocryphal. Somebody will have to figure out where this white paper is. But I think it was uh, IBM that deployed something like uh, 500 million hard drives across the world. You know, everybody's got a hard drive in their computer. Well, a decade ago, they started putting accelerometers in the hard drive so that if you dropped your laptop, they could place the head, park the head so that you didn't destroy your data. Um, well, you've got an accelerometer in in a half a billion hard drives. What a, what could we do with that data? And they very quickly started to map out the seismic movements, the plate tectonics of the globe. You've got this huge distributed network of accelerometers just sitting there monitoring the vibrations. That's the point. And so the ability to detect plate migration was was kind of amazing. It was um, an afterthought, but a, a, a pleasant one. Um, and then sort of that secondary question of uh, how do you pull data back from the edge? Um, in a in a long distance situation like that, there's there's not a lot of options. There's obviously harvesting where you have to go back and you know pull the boards back in and then download the data. Um, there's long distance transmission via LoRa and other things. Um, it, it's power hungry and you don't have very good coverage. Uh, then there's like uh, fun futuristic Star Wars things where um, I think there's a handful of companies out there doing uh, what is it CubeSats and microsatellites, and so can can I be out in the middle of nowhere and instead of transmitting sideways all the way back to the base station, can I transmit up a little ways and ride on a satellite instead? Um, so I don't know how implementable that is today, uh, but I think they're working on it. And um, yeah, interesting question. Um, what about you, Pete? So the thing I'm actually excited by is you can kind of save a lot of energy by only phoning home every like day or something like that. You know, if you were doing the machine learning on some remote server to count animals, you'd have to be continuously sending back that video stream. Whereas if you have a model that's actually able to count animals running locally on the chip at a very low sort of power usage, and then you're like saving up your energy from the sort of like the solar battery and you have something that's, you know, better than the Bluetooth low energy to kind of transmit like, a, you know, you have a cell phone sort of network thing that you only power up once a day. Um, then you can say, hey, I saw seven leopards today and send just that data up and that's a very small amount of data it can it only requires the radio to be on for a very short amount of time and so that's why i'm really hoping that having the processing happening on device and then just sending the actual information you care about very infrequently will make a lot of these applications a lot more possible uh, assuming there's less than 65,000 leopards out there, it's yes. two, 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 <laughs> two bytes in, instead of, you know, megabytes and megabytes worth of image data. Yeah, I, I, think if we I think if we spot more than 65,000 leopards, we will wake up especially <laughs> and send like a... <laughs> Things the are leopards, bad. The leopards are coming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> alert. <laughs> Indeed. Cool. Well, um, Pete, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, SparkFun folks out there, thank you so much for the questions. And uh, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. So um, if you have fun applications or fun questions, please ping me or Pete. Um, all the information will be out there. And um, yeah, uh, welcome to the, the world of machine learning. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Me too. Thanks, Nate. All right. Thanks, Pete. Good seeing you. See you, folks. <laughs>